All right, well, hello, University of Physics. This will be my first video to you, but I couldn't find any good videos for this chapter, really. We've got a couple of them posted in Blackboard, and they're more. One of them's really good. One of them's a lot of cultural stuff, but mostly for this chapter, it's just going to be me. As you get into chapter 30, uh, section one, I'm not going to cover. It would be good to read. Uh, by the way, I have someone running the video camera today, and I'll be giving them cues as to when to point at the screen and such, but there's no to yet. Um, I'm not going to cover section one at all. You can still read it, but I don't cover it, I don't test over it. Yeah, this is the last chapter then before we have our big unit test over magnetism. Okay, let's, let's see. I control when we move to the slides. So you can, you can pan to the first slide for a little bit and then come back after a little while. So, we've been doing magnetism, and now in this chapter, we're going to apply magnetism to circuits. We're not actually going to be calculating B anymore. No Biot-Savart law, no Ampere's law, no right-hand rules. We're just going to be applying magnetism to an electric circuit. Well, circuit analysis is all about voltage changes, right? voltage differences. So, how do you change voltage in a circuit? Well, we've done it basically two ways. We've done it with EMFs, and we've done it with devices. So, I, I'll leave it up there for a little bit. Uh, some EMFs that we've used, we've used batteries, and we used D-cells in our first labs. We used the black DC power supplies, the Pascal power supplies. Uh, we didn't use solar cells, but we could have. We used the wall socket, and that was an EMF. And what kind of devices did we use? Mostly, we use light bulbs, and we use our color band resistors. We're, I've at least used capacitors in class for that demo. Remember for RC circuits, where we had the light bulb on and off. I would use a diode. But I'm going to talk about a new one. What did you come back to me now? What did we just discuss in Chapter 29 as a new way to create an EMF? Chapter 29. What was the EMF equal to? A change in magnetic flux. That's a new way of coming up with an EMF. Instead of a battery, we could have a change in magnetic flux through a loop, and that will create a voltage. And we can count the number of loops, and we have Lenz's law to help us decide which way the current flows. I'm going to cue you, not from a video person, but for you, as you're watching this video, because I hope you're using the PowerPoint slides in conjunction with the video. And so now I've just jumped to PowerPoint slide three, which just says change in magnetic flux does cause an induced voltage. So in this chapter, we're going to learn how to use that to our advantage and put that into a circuit with a device called an inductor. I'm going to introduce the inductor by a big compare and contrast with what we already know, resistors and capacitors. You don't need to go to the screen for quite a while. You can just leave it on the whiteboard. And we'll have a big summary slide here in a little bit that I'll show. Okay, well, we have resistors and we have capacitors. And now today we're going to talk about inductors, which goes with a capital L. So I'm just going to do kind of a compare and contrast for those three things. Okay? There's their symbols in a circuit R, C, and L. What do resistors have? What's their electrical property? Resistance. Resistors have resistance. Capacitors have capacitance. Inductors, what they're called. An inductor has inductance, which reminds you again that we're using Faraday's law to induce EMFs. Slide four and another slide five. How do you show them in a circuit? Just how you show a resistor with a little sawtooth kind of thing, or a capacitor, like this. For an inductor, a new circuit symbol, inductors behave like solenoids, and so we show a coil of wire, kind of like that, to think about a solenoid. So, how does it, quote, work? For resistance, we've got to have current. If there's current in the resistor, what do we get? A voltage change. And that's how we discuss resistors is by 
the voltage change that's caused by current passing through there. Well, for a capacitor, when you need you need Q on the C, you charge on the capacitor, and if you put charge on the capacitor, what do you get? You need a delta voltage. Well, now we need a, a new expression like that for inductors. How does an inductor work? An inductor makes its voltage by a change in magnetic flux. But just to remind you, what is magnetic flux? In a simple sense, magnetic flux is a B field times an area. Typically, we're going to leave the area constant, so we can take that outside the derivative. And so the thing that does the changing is usually the B field. And what causes every B field, every formula for B that we've had, the B field of a long straight wire, the B field of a current loop, the B field of a short segment of wire, B field of this, B field of that, B field of the other. Every case, it's got a current and some other stuff, usually some geometry. That geometry stays constant, like the area, and it turns out that this EMF is always proportional in an inductor to a changing current. So what we're going to say over here is that a changing I through an inductor leads to a change in voltage. So something happens in each case to make a voltage. Either we have current, therefore there's a voltage change. Or we have charge, and there's a voltage change. Or we have a change in current, then there's a voltage change. So read section 30-2 in particular, which talks about this in detail and also in the MIT lecture number 20. I think the first half of it is all I assigned, but he talks about this in quite a bit of detail also. Okay, I'm on to my PowerPoint slide number seven. I just rephrased this. Uh, it's kind of a chicken and egg thing. Does the current cause the delta V, or does the delta V cause the current? So I phrase this another way and say, the delta V is required to have current. You won't get any current through a resistor unless there is a voltage change. You won't get any charge on a capacitor unless there's a voltage change across that capacitance, right? How do you charge a capacitor? Hook a battery up to it. You've got to have a delta V to have that Q. Same thing here. Delta V change in voltage is required to change the I through the inductor. So again, just kind of the same way said, same thing said two different ways. I causes delta V. It's not really causal, okay? but you can think of it that way. I causes delta V, or delta V causes delta V causes I. Like I said, kind of a chicken and egg scenario. They both actually happen simultaneously. Okay, on to slide number eight. The electrical definition of resistance, what we call Ohm's law, R, is the voltage across the resistor divided by the current. You might say it this way. But I don't like having a delta V in the numerator and not having one in the denominator, so I don't typically use that. This means the same thing, the voltage across the resistor, that's a delta V, that's a change in voltage. What's the definition for here? Capacitance was the charge divided by that voltage change. C over Q over V. Well, over here, the inductance is defined to be the magnetic flux through that solenoidal kind of device, right? There's lots of magnetic flux. If the, just think about that for a minute. If that solenoid has changing, has current in it, period. If that solenoid has current in it, then it's going to act a little bit like a bar magnet. The field lines kind of doing that. And spreading out and coming back around. 
connection. So there's, if there's refill lines, there is magnetic flux. L is defined to be the magnetic flux divided by the current. A um, couple of things to amplify this since this is the new expression. All of this in these two columns is hopefully review for you. Okay. The flux here that I'm thinking about is the flux through all the loops. Over here in Faraday's law, that flux was the flux through one loop. And that's why the end showed up explicitly. But I'm going to kind of absorb that end into the process so we don't have to keep referring to N the flux dt. We'll just defer to flux instead of N times the flux in one loop. So that N has been absorbed into that. So you won't see me writing the N anymore. So what does L tell you? Well, let's back up a little bit. What does R tell you? R kind of tells you how much current it takes to cause a given voltage drop. It's related to those two. What does capacitance tell you? How much charge you can store on a capacitor per volt. Well, what does the inductance tell you? It tells you how much flux the inductor creates per unit of current. So for instance, if this inductor had lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of windings, there'd be a lot of flux per amp. If that inductor had two or three windings, it'd be a very small number of, amount of flux per amp. So one way to think about the inductance is how many windings. It's more than how many windings, but that's a part of it. Another way to think about this is again, it's B field times some constants. So the inductance tells you how much B field do you get per unit of current. A bigger inductor means you get more B field per amp. A bigger capacitor means you get more coulombs stored per volt. A bigger resistor means you get a bigger voltage drop per amp. On a slide number nine. Usually when we're doing Ohm's law, we turn this around and say, okay, the voltage drop across the resistor is I times R. Equations are the same. Um, we put a minus sign. Why the minus sign? Well, because typically when we're doing a Kirchhoff's rule of analysis, we go through a resistor in the direction of the current. So I'm, I'm assuming the current is going through the resistor, and that makes this the high voltage and that the low voltage, and so the voltage is decreasing, a voltage drop. Maybe I should call that a voltage drop minus IR. Same way here. If there's charge on this capacitor, and there's the high side, there's the low side, there's going to be a voltage drop as you go from high to low. Which is Q over C. Again, the minus sign isn't critical, but the way we do our Kirchhoff's loop analyses, we usually wind up subtracting those voltages. Okay. Well, we're going to have the same thing over here, same kind of an idea. Now, think about this one for a minute while I think about what I want to say. Well, it relates back to Faraday's law. Faraday's law is just related to deflux dt. I've already absorbed the n inside here, so we can think about that n not being here. So we'll write this down in a couple of stages. Vl, if we solve that for the voltage, is minus deflux dt. Remember, the n has been sucked inside here. But the flux is equal to L times I for the line above it. So this is minus D L I D T. And inductances tend to be constant for the devices, and so this will be minus minus L D I D T. 
Let me stop here for just a minute and emphasize that from time to time, probably all the time, what do I call this? Ohm's Law, right? We could call this, nobody does but me, <laughs> but we could call this Ohm's Law for capacitors. And we could call this law in each case. Well, when you watch the, the MIT video, you're going to see Dr. Lewin kind of go off on John Coley a little bit, say, because you know, they used the John Coley textbook, or they did back in 2005 when those videos were recorded. And he's going to go off on it and say, well, uh, Professor John Coley doesn't really understand how inductors work. And they have a little axe to grind with each other. But I don't pay a whole lot of attention to that. I'm resolving it this way, that when we do a Kirchhoff's loop analysis, this is what we're going to write down for resistor. This is what we're going to write down for a capacitor. And this is what we're going to write down for an inductor. Mr. Lewin would not like me saying it that way. But he's not here. So this is the way I'm going to say it. It matches up with what's in the textbook. Now, for most resistors, not for light bulbs, but for most resistors, V and I are proportional to each other. You double the voltage, you double the current. Triple the voltage, you triple the current. Since I is proportional to VR, that means R is a constant. Right? You get a resistor out of the drawer, and it's a 300 ohm resistor, and it doesn't really care which day you take it out of the drawer. Yeah, this is It's a 300 ohm resistor today, it's a 300 ohm resistor tomorrow, so forth. Again, light bulbs, they change. Not by time of day, but by temperature. Well, similar for this. The voltage is proportional to Q, so C is a constant for most capacitors. Over here, the voltage is proportional to DL to DIET in general, because I is proportional to B, and B is proportional to flux, and B is proportional to flux to T, and I'll just kind of need to change together. And so L is a constant. So you know, you've got your drawer full of resistors, you've got your drawer full of capacitors, and when you take circuits class, you'll have the drawer full of inductors. And you'll have a certain value, and they'll be constant. I don't have even half an hour yet, has it? We started about 9.30, so. 9.30 here, where I am. I have no idea what time we'll be when we watch this. All right, well, let's keep going with this little parallel development of these things. Oh, this is something that's not in the textbook. It's something that's not on the videos. It's just something I've developed over the years as a way for me to hopefully remind you of these two components and help you understand that. Um, usually, R is a function of geometry. I mean, here we gave an electrical definition. Remember, that's what I called these when we came up with them in class. And that's what I would call this. Um, this is my electrical definition of L. But the electricity doesn't determine R, because R is a constant. R is determined, really, by geometry. And materials. What shape, what geometry does your material have? That tells you the resistance. So for a wire, I think I wrote this equation down once. I didn't ask you to deal with it. I on the test, I still want. But resistance, 
depends on the length of the wire, it depends on the cross-sectional area of the wire, and it depends on what's called the resistivity, a property of the material. We did the same thing for capacitors. C is determined not by the charge on it, not by the voltage across it, because that ratio tends to be constant. C is determined by this one. Geometry and material. And so again, C was depends on the area of the capacitor points, the distance between them, epsilon naught, and our dielectric constant. Well, guess what? L is determined by your what? Geometry and material. And in the textbook, for a solenoid, turns out that L depends on the area of the solenoid, the cross-sectional area of each loop, and the length, wow, let's see, area, the length, area, the length, area, and the length. And it also depends on the number of turns, and it depends on the permittivity constant. Why don't I write a mu naught there? Well, I could write a mu naught and then I'd have to put in some sort of a constant like this. You can think about it either way. But this is material and then it's geometry. So, yeah, parallel idea. In your textbook, this is section 30.2 that derived this. I think the MIT video derives this. And this is called the self inductance of that solenoid. Because it, it's doing something to itself. When there's current through it, it creates an EMF that by Lenz's law points in the opposite direction of the current change. All right. Here's the last slide of the set. So why don't you turn this back to the screen for a little while. You see that I've got this laid out a little prettier than it looks on the board. This doesn't look like my new slide. Right? Oh, yes, it does. Never mind. Never mind. Something just went on here. Yes, it does. Okay. So, the only thing that I haven't talked about yet are the energy properties of these three things and the units. So, let's do that. And you can focus on the slide now. I'm just going to write down the same stuff that's up there. So, we're going to talk about the energetics of each of these. I've run out of room for my conductors. I'll erase it all. We'll, we'll get a good shot of the board here in a minute, too, so you can see where I wound up on the board with this same development. Okay. For resistors, we don't typically talk about energy. We talk about power. Okay. We talk about the energy dissipation rate, how much power does that resistor burn? How much power does it use up? And it can be the current times the voltage in the resistor, or it can be I squared divided by R, no, I squared times R. That's. Or it can be the voltage across the resistor divided by R. Okay. That gives you the power. Okay. For the capacitor, we developed an expression for the amount of energy stored. I think we call that U, it was potential energy. And we had it as one half CV squared, or one half Q squared over C, or one half QB. Okay. So you see that line right here. We, we've had this basic expression, and then I just changed it to those other expressions. How did I change it? By using what I call Ohm's law. Forget the minus sign, but I could change, I could change C to be Q over V, and so that's how I got this either expression. So, okay. Well, same thing over here. Turns out there's potential energy stored in an inductor. Let's back up for a minute. Why is there potential energy stored in a capacitor? Why is there potential energy stored in a capacitor? Why is there potential energy in anything? 
Why is there potential energy in this water bottle when I pick it up in the air? Why is there potential energy in a spring if I stretch it out? Because I had to do work to move it. I had to do work to pick this bottle up. That's the potential energy. I had to do work to stretch that spring. That's the potential energy. I have to do work to charge a capacitor. That's the potential energy. It takes work to shove all those positive charges together in one place. And there's the expression for the energy. Well, it takes work to shove current through an inductor. Why? Because of Faraday's law. When you try to shove current through an inductor, when you try to change the magnetic flux in that inductor, it pushes back. It creates an induced voltage that always opposes what you're doing. And so it takes work to establish that current. And that means that there's potential energy stored in that inductor. And there's the way we're going to write it. We could use our Ohm's law idea to change that into different forms that I almost never see are written that way. This is usually the only way we see it. Now, we can take this and differentiate it with respect to time and come up with the rate of power storage. How much energy are we storing per second? Turns out to be the current times the voltage. How much energy are we storing per second in a capacitor? Turns out to be the current. So in an inductor, the current times the voltage. And one last expression, and then we're pretty much done with this slide. There was an energy density. We talked about capacitors. Take the potential energy of a capacitor and divide it by its volume. And that turned out to be related to the actual E field. And I talked about how amazing that was. Okay. It's this expression right here. But when we charge a capacitor, where is that potential energy? Well, it might be in the charges, it might be on the plates. But one way to think about it is it's in the E field itself. Same thing is true when you energize an inductor. We don't say charge it, we say energize it. When you energize an inductor, you can think about the energy as being stored in that magnetic field. And so the potential energy divided by the volume of that solenoid, again, the MIT video derives this formula turns out to be one half B squared over mu. Very similar looking formula for magnetic as for electric. Very last thing on this slide just reminds you of the units. The units can come from our Ohm's law expression. Units for resistors are volts per amps. Comes from Ohm's law, volts per amps, so called ohms. Units of a capacitor comes from Ohm's law, coulombs per volt. Units of inductance comes from this expression that I call Ohm's law. Flux units divided by current units. Flux units are called Weber's. Current is in amps. And so you get Weber's per amps, which are named after Joseph Henry. It's called the Henry unit. All three of these are named after people. There was a Ohm, there was a Faraday, it's Farad, there was Henry, you know, Henry Okay, we're done with that slide. So you can come back to the board if you want to get a quick shot of the board with all my scribbles on it from this last long discussion. So capacitors, resistors, and inductors. All right. So I'm on to the second section of this set of units. Seven minutes. Second section of this chapter notes. Our first, if I outline this chapter, what we just did was Roman numeral one, which was inductors. So I hope we've got a little bit of a feel of what an inductor is. So this is what we did so far. This is what we're going to do next. Part two. LR circuits. Guess what? That means we're going to put an L and an R in a circuit. We're going to have an inductor resistor circuit. Uh, no, don't go to the screen. I'm going to have to talk for a while after this. So we've got these new things called inductors. 
We're going to put them in circuits. How do they behave in a circuit? This is kind of the simplest example of the LR circuit. It's very similar, very, very similar to RC circuits. I think I'm going to take these next two panels of the board and use them to do kind of the same thing we just did, a compare and contrast of RC circuits, which we've been through at least. You had test number two had RC circuits on it. Some of you are redoing that RC circuit problem, right? Hopefully that's going to get done, get turned in a few days. So we're going to take what we already did with RC circuits and come up with what we'll have for LR circuits in pretty simple fashion. I don't know why it's called LR instead of RL. When we do RC, why don't we do RL? I don't know. Just the way I've always said it. So let's look at RC circuits and LR circuits. Simplest RC circuit. And we might put a switch in there. Let's say that the switch is open at the moment. So nothing's happening. We've got our battery, our resistor, we've got our capacitor. So, so the same thing over here, let's have a battery. Looks like that's all right. We'll put an inductor in, we'll put a resistor in. So we've got our voltage, we've got a switch. My inductor, got my resistor. Let's do a Kirchhoff's loop rule going around this loop. You'll find that the MIT guy does this differently than I do. Again, he's got his axe to grind about how people do this. He's got his way that he thinks is right, and everybody else has got a misunderstanding. Oh, well. Let's start here at the lower left hand corner and go around the loop. So we gain a battery voltage. Oh, there's some current flowing. Let's, let's close the switch. And we'll say current flows in that direction. So I gain the battery voltage. I lose voltage because I go through the resistor. I lose law minus IR. There's some positive charge building up on that capacitor. And so this is high voltage at the pluses, low voltage at the minuses. I lose some voltage there. And now I'm back to my start. So there's my loop. We'll do the same thing for the inductor. Start here. Let's assume current flows that way. Close the switch. Okay. Current is going to flow into that inductor. It's going to make some B field. The inductor is going to respond in such a way as to fight the creation of that B field, or as to fight that current going through it. 